I would first like to thank uh, my seven, eight, that is, distinguished colleagues for taking time from their busy schedules to participate in this program. And I want to thank the three student organizations who have agreed to co-sponsor the program. They are the American Constitution Society, the Women's Law Society, and the UCI Law Chapter of the National Lawyers Guild. This promises to be a momentous Supreme Court term. We already know that there are major cases involving the Affordable Care Act, the contentious intersection of religious freedom and non-discrimination laws, as well as criminal law and intellectual property issues. In addition, the court, as you all know, starts with only eight justices because of the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the longtime liberal stalwart of the court. And the country now has the pending nomination of her replacement, Amy Coney Barrett, whose hearings are scheduled to start next week. If she is confirmed, I think it is safe to say it would move the balance of the court to the right. Additionally, some of the most important cases that the court may decide this year are not even yet on its formal docket. That's because it's likely that some of the literally dozens of cases already pending on procedures for the conduct of a presidential election will eventually make their way to the Supreme Court. In fact, one of them from South Carolina got there yesterday. Rick Hassan will be talking about that case later in the program. Just one other brief note before we begin, for those of you who got our memo yesterday, we have slightly changed the order of the program so that Jack Lerner will be fourth in order and Mark Rosenbaum will be sixth in order. We will start with Michelle Goodwin discussing the monumental case involving the Affordable Care Act. Take it away, Michelle. Henry, thank you so very much for having me on the Supreme Court Review today. So starting off with the Affordable Care Act, as you all recall, in 2010, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as a, the ACA or Obamacare, was enacted by Congress. And it's been a law that has been challenged ever since its enactment, with there being some members of Congress saying that they want to see the bill dead altogether, the law dead and also with um, challenges made by this president. The questions that are for the Supreme Court this year are the following. Whether the individual and state plaintiffs in this case have established Article Three standing to challenge the minimum coverage provision in the law, and also whether reducing the amount specified in the law to zero rendered its minimum coverage provision unconstitutional, unconstitutional, and if so, whether the minimum coverage provision is severable from the rest of the ACA. So let me just dive in really quickly. So the ACA's future continues to be uncertain as the law's constitutionality will again be considered by the United States Supreme Court in a case known as California v. Texas, also known as Texas v. U.S. in the lower court. Oral arguments are actually scheduled for this November, just next month on the 10th. This is an ongoing challenge because the United States Supreme Court has previously addressed this legislation. At issue in this case is the individual mandate. It provides that most people must maintain minimum level of health insurance coverage. Those who do not do so must pay a financial penalty, also known as a shared responsibility payment to the IRS. For some of you who are thinking about these issues in the wake of COVID, you might be thinking about Jacobson v. Massachusetts, and in that case, individuals who did not get vaccinated had to pay a fine or a fee. Now, the individual mandate was upheld as a constitutional exercise of Congress's taxing power five to four in NFIB versus Sebelius in 2012. Now we see this back with us. In 2017, there is a bill, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the TCJA, and in that Congress set the shared responsibility payment at zero dollars as of January 1st, 2019, and that is actually what leads us to the current litigation today. There are those that say that because now this has been rendered to zero, that in fact it no longer is constitutional to associate financial penalty because now it is zero. The question is whether the court 
might try to just severe that particular aspect of the law out, which would allow the Affordable Care Act to maintain its constitutionality, or whether the Supreme Court will say that this is an opportunity to get rid of the Affordable Care Act altogether. What does that look like in front of this court? Let's be clear that it was Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, who joined with the liberals in that five to four decision in the prior Supreme Court iteration. Though there are some that say that what's troubling about this is that the Supreme Court has decided to take this case on. That makes you think about Justice Sotomayor saying that, look, there's certain issues that are coming before the court where the Trump administration or things that the Trump administration might want get a speed pass into the court. We won't know oral arguments are November the 10th, 2020, where the Supreme Court will take up these issues. Let me make one final point because I know we have a great cast of my colleagues who are joining us today. If the ACA is struck down, there are many effects that we should be cons that we should be mindful about because there are many affordable care act provisions that could be abolished that americans have come to rely on including protections for people with pre-existing conditions subsidies to make individual health insurance more uh, affordable protections for young people up to the age of 26 to be under their parents insurance policies coverage for preventative care with no patient cost sharing, and so much more. I'm happy to go into further detail during Q&A, but I hope that what the appetite of the people who are joining us today to learn a little bit more about what's coming ahead with the ACA before this United States Supreme Court. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Dan Burke. Okay, so uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about the dispute between Oracle and Google. Uh, that's before the Supreme Court uh, during this term. Uh, and this is a case about APIs. APIs are uh, the features of computer software uh, that allow the software to interoperate with or to be compatible with other pieces of software. Uh, you know, you have a lot of uh, different software on your computer. It has to all work together. It has to be able, uh, different packages have to be able to talk to each other. Uh, and the APIs are the, are the mechanics that allow uh, the software to do that. Um, in particular, when uh, Google designed the Android operating system that a lot of you have on your cell phones, um, it uh, uh, designed it in such a way that it used uh, uh, interoperability features um, from the Java uh, type of software that is owned by Oracle. Oracle claims that that is a copyright violation to adopt uh, that organization and, and structure uh, from their software. Now, that all sounds really technical and really nerdy. Uh, and, and maybe difficult to understand, but actually we all experience this uh, really every day. Um, anytime, for example, that you try to uh, plug an appliance uh, into the wall socket, right, into the electrical receptacle in, in your house, um, you're dealing with interoperability, right? You expect that the plug of that appliance is gonna fit into the shape of the uh, outlet that's in your house and it's gonna be compatible with the, with the voltage in your house. Um, and you can imagine the kinds of problems that would arise if somebody had rights over or control over uh, the use of the electrical socket uh, configuration, right? Um, they could potentially uh, either exclude uh, uh, other uh, uh, competitors from the market, you know, people who are trying to design appliances, um, or they could charge them uh, exorbitant fees uh, to use that configuration. Um, or you could end up with a marketplace where everybody designed their own uh, particular plug and socket configuration, which seems to happen with Apple computers anyway, uh, and sometimes I guess with Tesla, right? Um, but uh, uh, if you travel, you're also aware that there could be more than one type of outlet configuration, right? Sometimes you go to uh, Europe or you go to Britain and you see one of the other types of outlets that I'm showing you here. Uh, and in order to plug your North American device into that outlet, you need an adapter. That's essentially what Google did here was they created a, a sort of an adapter um, that would allow uh, their products, uh, Android, to interoperate with all the other devices that use Java. Um, and uh, the assertion by Oracle is uh, you can't do that. We own that configuration. Uh, we have a copyright on that configuration. Um, and doing that infringes our copyright. Now, um, that's kind of a surprising assertion to make in copyright because copyright is supposed to cover expressive works, you know, things that are artistic, things that are aesthetic. 
Um, and it's not supposed to cover things that are technical and utilitarian and functional. And we thought we had that all figured out for computer software uh, with a series of cases that were decided back in the early 1990s um, across the country, uh, pretty much concluding that these types of technical features are not subject to copyright. That was not the conclusion reached by the appellate court in this case, the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Uh, and so that's the first issue in this case that's in front of the Supreme Court now is, um, can you have copyright in this type of a technical configuration that allows interoperability between types of software? Um, the second related question that's in front of the court is, um, was Google's use of this uh, organizational structure, uh, could that have been a fair use? Uh, because fair use, of course, is a defense to copyright infringement. It says that sometimes you're allowed to use copyrighted works uh, without the permission of the copyright owner uh, under certain circumstances. And we have a long line of cases that say when you are copying software in order to get at the technical or functional aspects of it, uh, particularly in the context of interoperability or product compatibility, um, that that could be a fair use. Um, that is what the jury found in this particular case, that Google's use uh, was a fair use. Um, uh, surprisingly, the Federal Circuit overturned that jury finding. Uh, surprising, first of all, because it's a very high standard, you know, to, to throw out a jury uh, finding. Um, uh, and even more surprising uh, was the rationale of the Federal Circuit. They said, well, uh, the fair use question is a question of law, and we don't have to listen to the jury anyway. Um, and that'll make your head hurt if you think about it for a while. So that's the second question the Supreme Court has, is whether Google's use, assuming that there is copyright here, whether it could have been a fair use. We're kind of in uncharted uh, waters here because the Supreme Court's jurisprudence for copyright over the past couple of decades um, has been kind of a cage fight uh, between Justice Breyer, uh, who was a copyright professor before he went on the bench, um, and Justice Ginsburg, uh, who also considered herself to be a copyright expert, possibly because her daughter is a famous copyright professor at Columbia uh, Law School. Uh, and they would kind of duke it out uh, in the copyright cases that the court decided. Uh, Justice Ginsburg had a very expansive view of copyright. Uh, Justice Breyer had a much more limited or restricted view of copyright. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, Justice Ginsburg is no longer there. So we're waiting to see if the court will follow the lead of uh, Justice Breyer as the remaining copyright expert uh, on the court, or maybe some of the new appointees will have their own uh, view, their own uh, direction that they want to go. Um, uh, if uh, uh, the court does uphold uh, the Federal Circuit, it will certainly upend and disrupt a lot of expectations that we thought were settled in the high-tech industries uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, but I will say that uh, typically the Supreme Court does not take Federal Circuit uh, cases on cert uh, in order to uphold them. At least in the patent area, uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court loves to overrule the Federal Circuit. Uh, we'll have to see if they feel the same way in a copyright case. Federal Circuit doesn't do many copyright cases. Uh, it's kind of a weird uh, jurisdictional, subject matter jurisdictional anomaly if they even have this copyright case. Um, but uh, um, uh, we'll have to see what happens, and we're all kind of biting our nails, uh, waiting to see how this will turn out, especially without Justice Ginsburg on the bench anymore. Thank you, Dan. Next, we'll hear from Karin Gustafson. Thank you. Thanks, Henry, for organizing this event and for inviting me. I'm here to discuss Jones versus Mississippi, a case scheduled to be heard by the Supreme Court on November 3rd, election day. So I don't know that people will actually be paying attention to it when uh, uh, it is being argued, but it is an important case. Jones is one of um, many cases the Supreme Court has heard in the last decade that has to do with the sentencing of individuals who, uh, come, who commit their crimes while they are minors. Here, the question before the court is whether a sentencing court must find that a, ju uh, a juvenile is permanently incorrigible before sentencing the juvenile to life without possibility of parole. Counsel for Jones argues that imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole violates the Eighth Amendment's cruel and unusual punishment clause as disproportionate punishment. A little bit of background. Um, last October, the Supreme Court actually took up this issue uh, in the case of Lee Boyd Malvo, the juvenile who was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life without parole for his involvement in the DC sniper case. The Supreme Court dismissed that case in February when Virginia revamped its sentencing laws to allow those who had been convicted of crimes committed as juveniles 
to apply for parole after they had served uh, 26 years of imprisonment. So Melvo, um, as a result of, of that new legislative act, um, is, uh, 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 does have the ability to, to apply for parole. This case is being uh, reheard uh, with Brett Jones uh, as the party. Uh, Jones was convicted in Mississippi of killing his grandfather during uh, an, uh, a family argument. He was then sentenced to life without uh, possibility of parole. Now, um, uh, in the last decade, there have been two important cases on how uh, juveniles should be treated in sentencing. Uh, one of those cases is Miller versus Alabama, which was decided in 2012. There, the Supreme Court held that mandatory life without parole sentences for defendants who are under the age of 18 when they committed their crimes are unconstitutional. Uh, in Montgomery versus Louisiana, the Supreme Court barred life without parole quote, for all but the rarest of juvenile offenders, those whose crimes reflect permanent incorrigibility. Um, life without possibility of parole was found to be disproportionate punishment there under, uh, uh, in violation of the cruel and unusual punishment uh, provision of the Eighth Amendment. Um, so the state, uh, uh, argues that there need not be a, a finding on the record of uh, irreparable corruption or permanent uh, uh, incorrigibility. Um, but there are, but Jones and various Amici in this case um, argue that Montgomery and Miller cases stand for the principle that sentencing a minor to life without parole except in documented cases of irrepar irreparable uh, corruption. Uh, uh, documentation on the record uh, is unconstitutional. Um, uh, now, this case is interesting at this moment because we've had a change of uh, Supreme Court composition. Uh, the, uh, in the earlier cases, the liberal justices uh, found uh, that uh, sentencing for life without parole um, uh, against minors was problematic. The conservative justices didn't, but um, in the years uh, since Montgomery, we have two new conservative Supreme Court justices and it is possible we will have yet another. Uh, and so we may see some backtracking on uh, the rights of uh, minors in this case, but uh, that is yet to be seen. So Thank you very much, Karin. Now we'll hear from Jack Lerner. Hi, I'm here to talk about Van Buren, Van Buren against the United States. Uh, this is a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act case up from the 11th Circuit. Um, the CFAA was passed in 1986 to deter criminal hacking based in part on fears arising out of the 1983 film War Games starring Matthew Broderick in which a teenage hacker breaks into the federal nuclear weapons system. Uh, the statute pr prohibits intentionally accessing a computer without authorization or exceeding authorized access and obtaining information from basically any computer used in interstate commerce. <clears throat> this case is about how to interpret the second of those uh, uh, sets of conduct exceeds authorized access. Does it mean access information for inappropriate reasons or obtain information in the computer that you are not entitled to obtain? And so this case is about a police sergeant in Cummings, Georgia named Nathan Van Buren, who essentially accepted a bribe to look, into someone's, look up someone's license plate in the Georgia Crime Information uh, Center database to see whether that person was an undercover cop. Uh, this was a sting, and the FBI arrested Van Buren and charged him with felony violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. The jury convicted, the 11th Circuit affirmed, and they, they found fault with the jury instructions on another charge, which was honest services wire fraud, essentially bribery, and remanded for a new trial on that charge. But in upholding the CFAA, the 11th Circuit re relied on a 2010 holding in that circuit called United States versus Rodriguez. And the court characterized that as holding that even if, if a person with authority to access a computer can be guilty of computer fraud if that person subsequently misuses the computer. Uh, now, 
the CFA actually defines exceeded authorized access as to access a computer with authorization and to use such access to obtain or alter information in the computer that the accessor is not entitled to obtain or alter. So the 11th Circuit had already held that this standard was met when a Social Security Administration employee accessed a computer for, an, as it said, for a non-business reason, and which was, in that case, to look up people's birth dates and addresses. So was it you're looking at information you were authorized to look at for an improper reason, or were you look at, looking at information you simply weren't authorized to look at? And there's this big circuit split on this. That's pretty clear. So here in the Ninth Circuit, the United States versus No Saul case from 2012 says, Activities like Google chatting with friends, playing games, shopping, watching sports highlights on a work computer are routinely prohibited by employer u computer use policies. And so the, the Ninth Circuit was worried in that case under the broad interpretation of the um, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, as, and I'm quoting, such minor dalliances could become federal, would become federal crimes. So that's what this case is about. So the arguments in, in favor of upholding the, uh, of reversing the Eleventh Circuit you know, one is that, look, trespass norms don't extend to contract-based violation, based violations. Uh, that would lead to astonishing results or essentially to require the judges to create a new statute with exceptions. There's a very famous case out of L.A. Uh, about a, uh, a really awful cyberbullying incident from about 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, uh, it's the Lori Drew case, some of you may have heard of it, where a, a mom essentially was prosecuted under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for impersonating somebody on MySpace in a cyberbullying uh, incident and uh, thereby violating MySpace's contract terms. And people said that is really a misuse of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is about breaking into computers and not about just simply accessing information you didn't have access to. And so Oren Kerr, who, who is more conservative than your average privacy advocate, uh, argues that access without authorization has traditionally been limited to circumventing technological restrictions. And so the same limit should be imposed for exceeding authorized access. So think of it, I think, you know, think of it like, did you access a folder? You had, you had authority to access this one folder, but you know, when you got that access, were there other folders that you, were, that, that you weren't supposed to access, but you, that you access not, you already had the information and now you use it for an improper purpose. Uh, one of the arguments on the other side that I think is going to be compelling, the legislative history supports the 11th Circuit's interpretation, which is that some of the intention of Congress was to prevent government employees from accessing information in unauthorized ways. Uh, and another one is that the CFAA should be construed in a way that protects personal information. And, and both the Rodriguez case in the 11th Circuit and in this case, by the, uh, also in the 11th Circuit, talked about uh, government employees looking at private personal information for improper purposes. So what's going to happen in this case? Uh, it's very hard to say. I mean, we don't even know, as several other of my colleagues have said, the composition of the court when this case is ultimately decided. Uh, the court has been more protective of civil liberties in recent years with cases like United States versus Carpenter. Uh, but of course, most employers would say, no, we want to be able to enforce our computer use, use policies as, uh, as aggressively as possible. Uh, if I had to bet, I would say that, you know, what Oren Kerr was talking about as being, uh, being a potential problem would be that the case will be upheld, but that the court will articulate principles that eliminate some of the more ab absurd outcomes, right? Because I think what, uh, what the real fear is of all the many, many, you know, over a dozen amicus briefs filed in support of the petitioner and support, uh, you know, saying don't misconstrue exceeds authorized access to simply mean violating contractual terms. Uh, and so, so people are really worried that, you know, run any, anything that you do that, obsede, that, that, uh, that exceeds the terms of use could be a problem. And so you have media organizations who are saying, you know, uh, our source is going to be prosecuted now under Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for telling us things that happen and who knows what else. Oral argument in this case is on November 30th. Thank you very much, Jack. Next we'll hear from Professor Rachel Moran. Some of you may remember a credit card advertisement that goes like this, cost of two tickets, $46, cost of two hot dogs, two popcorns, two sodas, $27, cost of autograph baseball, $50, authentic conversation with your 11-year-old son, priceless. 
What the case in um, Uzugunam versus Przewski reminds us is that we have other priceless things, other priceless possessions, our constitutional rights. They are not readily monetizable any more than an authentic conversation with your 11-year-old son. So here's why the case is before the court. Um, Chike Uzugunam was a student at Georgia Gwinnett College and he went to the campus square outside the library and he wanted to distribute literature about his faith. And while he was doing this, a campus security officer told him that he was not allowed to do that because he had to get a permit to use one of two designated spaces for this kind of activity. So a month later, he actually got a permit and he was in one of the dedicated spaces and he was distributing his literature and making statements about his faith. And again, he was approached by a security officer and the officer said, you're not allowed to make statements in this space. You can distribute your leaflets, but you can't speak. So if you continue to speak, it's disorderly conduct. And so Uzud Bunam decided to leave and he never again tried to speak about his faith on campus or deliver leaflets. He graduated from the college a year later. Joseph Bradford was another student at the college and he had also wanted to speak about his faith and distribute literature, but he never did it because he saw what had happened to Uzugbunam. Bradford also graduated from the college. Now they may have graduated, but they didn't forget their alma mater. They sued in federal court and they argued that their first amendment rights had been violated. They asked for declaratory judgments that they had been violated. They also asked for injunctive relief and they asked for nominal damages as well as costs and attorney fees. And during the litigation, the college actually rescinded the policy about having to reserve the dedicated spaces and said that you could speak anywhere on the campus, you could distribute your leaflets anywhere, you only needed to reserve these spaces for groups of larger than 30. So the federal district court said, well, gee, Uzugbunam and Bradford have graduated, they've rescinded the policy, they have only nominal damages, and so this really, there's no compensatory damages, there's no meaningful injunctive relief, this is no longer a justiciable controversy and the case was dismissed. And the 11th Circuit affirmed. Now, as a result of that 11th Circuit decision, there's now a split in the circuits on whether nominal damages claims standing alone are sufficient to render a controversy justiciable. So there are courts that say that's enough. It's enough to have a standalone nominal damages claim. There are courts that say it's enough, but only if the damages if the damages result from the policy having been actively enforced against you. And the third view is the 11th Circuit view. There is no justiciable controversy for nominal damages claims standing alone. So what's at stake here? According to the plaintiffs, if they are not allowed to pursue their nominal damages claims, their constitutional violations will be swept under the rug because they're a particularly vulnerable group. And all of you who are students will be interested in this. Why are they vulnerable? Because they're a transient population. They will often graduate before a case is resolved. And so it's mooted out by their graduation. Also, colleges often change their policies in response to litigation. So that may also render it non-justiciable. And finally, because your students, many of the violations that you might experience, like free speech violations, don't have a monetizable value. They won't lead to compensatory damages. So the plaintiffs say, if you don't take cases like ours with nominal damages only, our harms will be invisible to the federal courts. The defendants take the position that there will still be plenty of protection because cases that involve compensatory damages or live injunctive relief will still go forward and they will typically be a forum to air these concerns. Moreover, the courts will have the option to offer something more than symbolic relief, meaningful kinds of interventions for obviously very crowded dockets. So just to return to 
my analogy to the credit card ad at the beginning, here's what's really at stake. Cost of being ejected from the campus square, zero dollars. Having your First Amendment rights violated, priceless. <laughs> For everything else, there's a federal court. Or maybe there's one even for those priceless rights standing alone. Thank you very much, Rachel. Next, we'll hear from Mark Rosenbaum. Well, it's nice to be here with everyone, um, especially this term, as you said, not just because of the decisions of the Supreme Court to follow, but because this is a term where the integrity of the court is so much a public issue. Yesterday, as was widely reported, the Supreme Court said that it would not hear a case from a Kentucky clerk who refused to issue marriage licenses for same-sex couples. Two justices, Justice Thomas and Justice Alito, concurred in that decision, but they used the cert denial to renew their criticism of the Obergefell case, citing what Justice Thomas characterized as the, ru the ruinous consequences for religious liberty that came from that case. Justice Thomas wrote, due to Obergefell, those with sincerely held religious beliefs concerning liberty will find it increasingly dis difficult to participate in society without running afoul of Obergefell and its effect on other anti-discrimination laws. Justice Thomas refers to the court's ungenerous interpretation of the free exercise clause, leaving those with religious objections in the lurch. Chief Justice Roberts in Obergefell, as you may recall in his dissent, predicted that establishing a right to marry would lead to cases such as a religious adoption agency not being permitted to place children in same-sex married, with respect to same-sex married couples. One reason perhaps that there were not four votes for taking this case is that there is already a case on the court's docket that could do the work of limiting Obergefell, undermining Obergefell, gutting Obergefell, by means of overriding anti-discrimination laws, and that's Fulton versus the city of Philadelphia to be argued on November 4th. Fulton is broadly similar to the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, the case of the Colorado baker who refused on free exercise and free speech grounds to create a wedding cake for a same-sex couple. In Fulton, Fulton is a, um, a foster mom who the um, had, had many times previously served in that capacity. The city of Philadelphia relied on a private agent, on private agencies to find, train, oversee, and support families to provide homes for the some 5,000 5, foster children in uh, the care and custody of the city of Philadelphia. One of those agencies is Catholic Social Services, part of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Catholic Social Services would not certify as a relationship suitable for parenting any couple that it believed was inconsistent with Catholic beliefs, though it would refer such, agency, uh, such families to other agencies, and that of course included same-sex couples. In 2018, the Philadelphia Enquirer wrote a story that brought to light that the city, um, that the, the fact that Catholic Social Services acted in this manner, along with one other religious agency. Um, and after the publication of that story, the city of Philadelphia carried out an investigation of its agencies, limited to the religious agencies, and terminated its relationship with Catholic Social Services with respect to finding homes for foster children. A lawsuit was filed by Ms. Fulton against the city of Philadelphia. The city of Philadelphia prevailed in both the district court and the third circuit on its argument, relying upon what it characterized as neutral anti-discrimination laws that it said would be violated were in fact it to continue its relationship with Catholic social services. It said that the consequences were that religious entities or entities with deeply held secular views are not constitutionally entitled to enter into government contracts and then defy those terms to which they object. Philadelphia said that that would produce mayhem in government contracting. 
The Third Circuit relied upon a controversial decision authored by Justice Scalia, perhaps ironically, that involved the constitutionality of filing a, firing a tribal member for smoking peyote, a criminal violation under the laws there, Employment Division versus Smith. That case held that government actions that substantially burden religious exercises are subject to strict scrutiny unless they are carried out under neutral and generally applicable laws like anti-discrimination laws that are free from hostility towards religious belief. Like the Masterpiece uh, Cake Shop case, there are ways to decide this case without overruling Smith, um, without substituting a new test that would undercut the application of anti-discrimination laws or lead to a reversal or limitation of Obergefell. The United States, interestingly enough, prior to the death of Justice Ginsburg, filed an amicus brief that'll be arguing in, in the case, and it did not call for the overruling of the Smith case. Um, as I said, there are grounds that the United States pointed out, like the fact that Philadelphia said to one of the religious figures, why don't you get in line with Pope uh, Francis? Um, and that it had been granting exemptions along the way with respect to um, uh, uh, foster family processes. The fear among liberals is that the free exercise religious liberty clause is going to be defined in a manner that goes beyond sincere religious objections in a context that is inconsistent with requisite religious neutrality on the part of the state. One that creates a general right under the free exercise clause for individuals engaged in a secular economy to be exempted from general anti-discrimination laws. So what's pitted here are anti-discrimination laws against claims of free exercise and religious liberty. The question is what the court would do in terms of defining free exercise uh, and what constitutes a substantial burden. So Fulton is about more than finding foster families. It's certainly more about pastry at weddings. It's about perhaps finding a ways around anti-discrimination laws, access to medical care, and diminishing the power of political struggle to use the courts and the legislature to end bigotry and hatred based on characteristics of marginalized groups. Thank you very much, Mark. Next, we'll hear from Paul Hoffman. Thank you, Henry, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm going to speak about uh, Doe versus Nestle and Cargill. Uh, and in the interest of full disclosure, that's my one of my cases. And um, I've been handling it for the last 15 years. It's scheduled for argument on December 1st. Um, the case involves the interpretation of the Alien Tort Statute, uh, which is a provision from the First Judiciary Act of 1789 that allows non-citizens to bring tort action, actions for torts committed in violation of the law of nations in the lower federal courts. Since 1980, um, this statute has been the main vehicle for international human rights litigation in US courts. The first 15 years from about 1980 to 1995, um, there were many cases brought against individual perpetrators in U.S. courts, including people like Ferdinand Marcos, uh, which led to some substantial judgments. Um, for the last 25 years, human rights litigators have been bringing cases against corporations, both U.S. corporations and foreign corporations in U.S. courts, uh, alleging that the corporations have been complicit in international human rights, rights violations that take place outside of U.S. territory. There are three main cases that sort of lead up to this. Um, Sosa versus Alvarez Machine, which is a case in 2004 where the Supreme Court first uh, interpreted the Alien Tort Statute and found that um, nothing from 1789 to 2004 um, had deprived the courts of their ability to recognize um, law of nations violations under federal common law toward actions um, for that. Uh, but they, the court cautioned in a number of ways that the court should exercise judicial caution and vigilant doorkeeping 
um, in recognizing any new claims under the Alien Tort Statute. Um, that led to substantial litigation about the meaning of SOSA in the lower courts. And uh, the next case was Kiobel versus Royal Dutch Petroleum in, in 2013. Um, and that was a case where the court decided that um, the alien, that claims under the Alien Tort Statute should be subject to the presumption against extraterritoriality. And therefore, unless you are arguing a case where the claims touched and concerned the US, the United States substantially enough, um, the presumption barred the claim. That again led to substantial um, litigation in the, uh, in the circuit courts. Um, and then in 2018, the court returned to the Alien Tort Statute in a case called Jessner, uh, which had to do with a Jordanian bank that was making payments to support suicide bombers. Um, in that case, the court decided that based on the cautionary principles in SOSA, that there, should no, there shouldn't be corporate liability for foreign corporations under the Alien Tort Statute. So the Doe versus Nestle and Cargill case is a case against two U.S. corporations alleging that they have aided and abetted a system of child slavery on cocoa plantations in the Ivory Coast in order to guarantee a steady supply of cheap cocoa beans for their chocolate production. Um, the case has been up and down to the Ninth Circuit a couple of times. Uh, usually dismissed at the district court level and overturned by the Ninth Circuit. Um, the issues in front of the court are, well, the Solicitor General has um, come in uh, on the side of the companies and, and argued that basically that the court should have no contemporary, that the statute should have no contemporary meaning. But they've asked the court to decide that there's no aiding and abetting liability whatsoever under the statute. That was not raised by the companies. It's not clear if the court will will resolve that question. The other two questions are whether aiding and abetting by U.S. corporations, um, these kind of claims, are claims that overcome the presumption against extraterritoriality, which is what the Ninth Circuit decided. The companies are saying that uh, because the violations took place in the Ivory Coast, the actual slavery took place in the Ivory Coast, that that's where the focus of the claims are and it should be found not to be extraterritorial, that you can't have those claims. And they say that, that aiding and abetting is a secondary liability theory, and that should not count in terms of the application of the presumption. The plaintiffs are arguing that um, that is an ahistorical way of looking at the alien tort statute, that the main purpose that the founders had uh, was to address claims by foreign subjects where the United States uh, might be found uh, liable under international law for a failure to give um, a forum for redress. Um, the other issue before the court is whether domestic corporations are subject to liability under the Alien Tort Statute. Um, contrary to briefs that the government filed in the Kiobel and Jessner cases, the Solicitor General has now taken the position that there should be no corporate liability under the Alien Tort Statute. And obviously the companies take the same position. And their argument basically is that, 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 they should, that the court should leave that judgment to Congress. And the plaintiffs are taking the position in accordance with the prior briefs that the United States has filed that corporate tort liability is a longstanding feature of not only of American jurisprudence, but of all legal systems and that um, it's, it, there's no reason to exclude any particular category of defendant and in particular corporations from the scope of, of alien tort statute liability. So what's at stake here really is whether a conservative majority and maybe an, even, an increased conservative majority on the court is going to decide to overturn SOSA directly and find that there can't be contemporary claims under the alien tort statute or to kill it by a thousand cuts, um, or to allow this claim involving child exploitation by companies over a long period of time is the, is the kind of claim that the court will allow to proceed. Thank you very much, Paul. And now we'll hear from Rick Hassan. Thanks very much. It's 
great to be with uh, all of you. Uh, my presentation will be slightly different. Uh, although there is a case that the court decided last week that it's going to hear uh, involving uh, the Voting Rights Act uh, and its application in Arizona, uh, that won't be heard until January or February. I'm gonna focus instead on the question that a lot of people uh, care about right now, which is um, what's happening with the Supreme Court and this current election. Uh, just in the time since this program started, uh, there have been two more federal court decisions. Uh, so just in the last 40 minutes, we've had two more federal court decisions. There are about 350 cases related to COVID in the election that are in state and federal courts. I mean, it's just an astounding number. It's more than the number of cases we usually have in a two-year period. Just yesterday, the United States Supreme Court decided an emergency case coming out of South Carolina, uh, the question there was whether a federal court could dispense with the requirement that if you want to um, put in an absentee ballot in that state, you have to get a witness's signature. In the primary season, that requirement was put on hold given COVID. Ordinarily, it's not a big burden to get someone's signature, but it becomes a big burden in times of COVID. Um, the district court reimposed that for the general election. A Fourth Circuit panel reversed that. The en banc Fourth Circuit reversed that. The Supreme Court reversed that. Uh, so, I mean, that is, you know, like a ping pong match. Uh, and we've got another case uh, pending before the Supreme Court that could be decided later today. I expect it will be later this week involving changes to mail-in balloting in Pennsylvania. That case is really important because it raises the question, to what extent can state legislatures uh, impose rules for conducting presidential elections under their power under Article 2 when a state Supreme Court, in this case, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court says, what you're doing violates the state constitution. Uh, those of you who are old enough to remember Bush versus Gore, uh, uh, the 2000 case that ended the federal um, dispute uh, over uh, which, of, uh, which candidate Bush or Gore was gonna get Florida's electoral college votes and win the presidency you may remember that issue appeared in an early version of that uh, case as well. Let me speak more generally rather than talk about the South Carolina or Pennsylvania case for the last few minutes I have about what to expect and what we're seeing. Basically, we've seen a mixed bag in the lower courts. Some lower courts, uh, federal courts and state courts have taken the position that because of the pandemic, uh, the usual rules for conducting the election need to be changed to give voters easier access to vote. Uh, some courts have said that uh, that's not permissible and that you have to have deference to election authorities and state officials about what to do. The signal coming from the Supreme Court in the South Carolina case last night and the signal that came uh, from a case called RNC versus DNC involving the Wisconsin primary back in April is that the court is going to not uh, defer to um, federal district courts, but instead defer to state officials. That is, uh, and Ju Justice Kavanaugh said it in a concurring opinion last night, we trust the state officials to decide what election accommodations need to be made to deal with health and safety. That means in states where they're not making it easier for people to vote during the pandemic, those rules are likely to stay in place. The other thing that Ju Justice Kavanaugh pointed to is something that's come to be known as the Purcell Principle and it's the idea that at least federal courts should not be making last minute changes to election rules because that can cause voter confusion and uh, that could uh, make it harder for election administrators. Ironically, Justice Kavanaugh invoked this principle and did it to change the rules to reimpose the signature requirement that had not been imposed. Um, three of the justices would have thrown out all the ballots that were already cast in South Carolina but the majority did not go along with that. And so ballots that were already cast under the rule that was in place, those will still count. The bottom line is, if you're looking for a court to protect voting rights, it's not going, to, in this pandemic, it's not going to be the Supreme Court. I expect we're going to see the Supreme Court uh, take um, uh, kind of a hands-off approach when it comes to plaintiffs looking for more relief and take the approach of rolling back the kinds of changes that lower courts have made, especially if they were made at the last minute. So just last night, for example, uh, a federal district court said that October 5th, Arizona voter registration deadline, we're kicking it to October 23rd. 
I expect within a day or two, that's going to be reversed by the Ninth Circuit or the Supreme Court. So as this litigation is continuing, the Supreme Court is likely to put the brakes on. And I just hope that the election is not close enough that we end up having the Supreme Court get involved in post-election litigation. If it's very close, I think that's possible. If it's not close, I think the country might dodge a bullet and we won't have yet another situation where it comes down to what the courts think in terms of who's going to be the next president. Thanks. Rick, thank you very much. Um, we'll try and do a, a, a few questions um, in our remaining time. The first question I think is best addressed um, by Michelle um, is um, if, Mich if Michelle is still around. Yes, um, I am. Okay, thank you. Which is um, a, a, a member of the audience asked uh, in California versus Texas and Texas, you know, the, the Affordable Care Act case, do you think that the individual mandate is severable? And besides your own thoughts about this, do you have any sense of where the court would be on this? So it is severable, and there are a number of legal scholars, constitutional scholars, uh, myself included, and many others, who suggest that it is uh, severable. The Supreme Court has actually used the doctrine of severability in prior cases and may choose to do so in this particular case. The court could also allow the case to allow the Affordable Care Act to stand, keeping in mind that in a five to four majority that the law previously withheld, the, the, the law previously survived um, challenges. So we might not see any changes with the Affordable Care Act, or we might see the severe, uh, that one part of it is severed and the rest of the law remains intact. As far as how we might predict uh, what this court will do, let's keep in mind that Justice Roberts has really cared about the integrity of the court, upholding his own reputation vis-a-vis -vis the court. You can see that in decisions this summer. I think it's important not to overstate things. Some people um, have said over uh, given cases over the summer that uh, Chief Justice Roberts forgot that he was conservative. There are some leading conservatives that said that he should resign from the court. Much of this is in relation to his decision in June Medical joining the liberals on the court to uphold abortion rights. But let's be clear, Chief Justice John Roberts has not suddenly turned into a liberal. Uh, he has not forgotten his uh, conservative bona fides, but instead he's looking at these issues in technical detail, whether we're looking at the importance of precedent and precedential value um, for this court, or whether he is making clear and holding up the principle that he, uh, that he asserted not long ago, which is that there are no such things as Trump judges, uh, Bush judges or Obama judges. And I think collectively, if we take all of that into account, we can see that this isn't about Chief Justice John Roberts just doing a kind of uh, conservative punting. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I'm gonna throw the next question to Rick Hassan, which is um, a question from, what is the status of the right to vote for former felons? Are they, a um, as and particularly perhaps focusing in on uh, what's going on in Florida and the whole effort there by uh, some nonprofits organizations to try and raise money to uh, help these people pay former fines so that they can then vote. Yeah, so uh, the status of felon voting, uh, people who've completed their sentences, differs from state to state. States get to set the qualifications, and some states disenfranchise felons for longer periods than others do. In Florida, uh, Florida voters passed an amendment uh, by, I think, a 67% margin, both supported by both Democrats and Republicans, to restore uh, voting rights to felons who've completed their sentences. Um, but then the Florida legislature came in and said, uh, we interpret this to mean that you have to pay all your fines and fees, which turns out to be very difficult in Florida because there's no central repository of how much you owe. And so when you sign under penalty of perjury and say, I don't owe anything, uh, you could be committing a new felony. And so you don't want to do that. Uh, so there was a challenge that this was a poll tax. There was a challenge that this violates due process since you don't know what you owe. Um, a federal district court agreed. Uh, the en banc uh, 11th Circuit disagreed, said this was perfectly fine. And so now there's been an effort by Mike Bloomberg and others to pay the fines and fees of those uh, uh, felons. And that process is ongoing. Um, uh, the voter registration was supposed to close last night in Florida, uh, but the uh, system crashed. 
It's now being kept open until 7 o'clock Eastern tonight, but there's a lawsuit pending to try and keep it open longer. That's not going to be enough time, even if it's a couple of more days, for lots of these felons uh, to get former felons to get their fines uh, paid. So while I think hundreds or maybe thousands of people have benefited from some of these efforts, um, and there have been some legal challenges that I don't think would be successful against these efforts, um, it's not going to help most felons vote in this election. There's something like 750,000 former felons uh, who are not yet re-enfranchised, thanks to this uh, ruling uh, from the 11th Circuit. Rick, one other question in, the, in this area. You've described some of the cases, but has the court been uniform in not making accommodations um, for expanded periods of time or other things to facilitate more voting in all of the, what I'll call the COVID-related cases that have arisen this year? Well, the only COVID-related case where the court let an accommodation stand was one where the state agreed to it. So the common thread seems to be if the state's willing to go along, but say, you know, the Trump campaign is, is uh, fighting it, well, if the state's willing to do it, we're going to let it happen. Uh, so I think that, that was a Rhode Island case. That was the only one so far. But I should say there have been a lot of accommodations that have been made in the lower courts that were not challenged and that are in place. Uh, and some, uh, you know, for example, in, in Nevada, uh, the Trump campaign challenged the expansion of all vote by mail, claiming it would lead to fraud. A federal district court rejected that, and that and that's, has stood. And so that expansion uh, has held. So it's not as though every expansion is being challenged at the Supreme Court and failing. It's just that the ones that make it all the way to the Supreme Court have not fared well. Thank you very much. I think um, we have we've gone through all the questions. Um, if any other, if any member of the panel would like to make any kind of a closing comment, we've got a few more, we've got a few more moments. So the, the floor is open if someone wants to. Uh, I'm just going to say vote, vote early, vote. And let me add to that, let's recognize the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the pioneering work that she did, not only on behalf of women, which was quite profound. It was a period of time where 66% of the Supreme Court's litigation was through the ACLU and Ruth Bader Ginsburg on sex discrimination laws. But she also had an exp expansive view about civil rights and civil liberties and cared deeply also about matters of justice related to voting, related to race, and related to LGBTQ equality. Thank you for hosting this, Henry. It's a really important thing that thank, we do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle. And for anyone who hasn't um, read it, uh, Justice Ginsburg's dissent earlier this year in the Wisconsin case is a particularly strong, trenchant example of her taking a, a complicated issue and making it very accessible on, on what rights were at stake. Um, and I want to thank all of the, uh, of the participants and also just to remind the members of the audience, if you want to get into the weeds of any of these cases, there's a great amount of material that you can find on all, on all of the cases on scotusblog.com and that the material is, is quite easy to access. Um, thank you all. Stay safe. And as Rick Hassan said, vote. Take care. <laughs>